You're listening to Start, Scale, Exit, Repeats. Serial Entrepreneur, Secrets Revealed, Trademarks and Copyrights. Yes, it's all about protecting the moat. In the book, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeats, by the way, the same name as the podcast. Uh, in the book, we have a chapter dedicated towards protecting your IP, protecting your... And there are a lot of different ways to protect your business. Uh, we're gonna, today, we're really going to focus on the legal aspects of protecting your business. And we have Jonathan Frost and Mike Rodenbaugh, who will be joining us in a few minutes to really talk about what it is you can do as a small business or as a startup to protect your IP, to protect your trademark, to protect your copy. And it's, 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 it's actually interesting because we have uh, a chapter in the book, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, dedicated to building a moat. It's absolutely crazy. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, Colin. Hey. Hey, we're just going to kick it off with an intro here. And, uh, but I appreciate you coming on. I know Jonathan's here. He's coming on in a minute as well. And uh, it takes a few minutes to get uh, to get people in the room on this Clubhouse app right now. So, uh, but that being said, is also being syndicated in podcast. And you might not know this, but if you're listening to it in podcast, it actually is a live show, and we do it every Friday at two o'clock Eastern, and we do it uh, on Clubhouse on a club called Startup Club. So if you do download the app, check out Startup Club and join us every two o'clock. We have phenomenal speakers who come on, like Mike Rodenbaugh and Jonathan Frost, two lawyers who are going to help us figure out how we can protect our IP, how we can protect our name, our copyright, and all of that. So we're very excited about that. Mike, we're, it's going to take about a few minutes to really kick off the show as the, as the people come into the audience. Uh, but what are your thoughts about just high level, Mike? What are your thoughts about today's show, and what do you think the listeners are going to get? What, what are the what's the benefit of the listeners are going to get from listening to you today? Um, hey, Colin. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting Jonathan and I on. It's much appreciated. Um, I think today the goal really is to just have an interactive conversation about intellectual property. Um, I've been practicing trademark law for about 30 years now. And um, we also focus a lot on copyrights and domain names um, as other forms of intellectual property that startups certainly should be thinking about as they develop their business plans and, and begin to operate. Um, all too often, you know, lots, lots of times uh, young companies don't think about these things until they have a problem. And at that point, that problem can be a really bad problem where they have to rebrand, for example. Um, and so we want to try to just give it a primer on what is a trademark and how to how to go about protecting your brand. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have some stories along the way. And obviously, uh, we're here to answer questions and, and have an interactive dialogue with uh, anybody who cares who cares to chime in. Yeah, I know. I got a couple horror stories for you. But before we jump into it, I just want to tee up the show again. You're listening to Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, Serial Entrepreneur Secrets Revealed, which is actually a syndicated podcast as well. If you're listening to podcasts, you can join us live on Clubhouse and Startup Club. Uh, I do want to announce that today that the, the book has now hit the number two spot on Amazon for starting a business in the United States. Uh, we're, we're hoping we hit number one today. Uh, the Forbes books did put the book, the ebook on sale for $1.99 for 24 hours only. And when they did that, the book shot up. Right now, we're just behind the lean startup and we're in front of zero to one. You probably know those books, uh, but we are a brand new book. We just came out October 3rd. And uh, a couple other things too, Mimi and Michelle, is that Yesterday, we had a meeting with Forbes Books, and they told us that they underestimated the print demand. We had uh, initially done 1,500. 
they did a reprint of 2000 and now they only have two weeks of inventory left on the book and it takes six weeks to restock so they're going to do some print on demand stuff in the meantime but uh but the fact is uh the physical book has gotten a lot of attention it's not like any book you've ever seen before it literally has 200 call outs 58 chapters uh 30 illustrations all color coded we designed it for the adhd entrepreneur and we've been getting a lot of attention for that so far. So they've done another reprint. They're doing of a thousand right now on the hardcover, and they're doing three thousand soft cover right now, uh, which will take a, about six weeks to get to market. But if you, uh, but if you want just just an ebook, it's a dollar ninety nine for twenty four hours only. We're excited to see we hit the number two spot in the United States for starting a business on Amazon. That is pretty incredible. Uh, considering it is still a brand new book and we're literally between the lean startup and zero to one and then number four is chat gpt millionaire which i can understand why because we all want to be a millionaire but uh start scale legs repeat it really is a book that tries to crack the code of what it is to succeed and start a business let's all right, all right. i don't know about you colin but what? i would call that a quality problem okay <laughs> oh, running out Startups. of books? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah uh, I don't yeah. know, man. But look at our friend Jonathan is right there below you. Let's bring him to the stage and make him and Mike a moderator. Oh, let me make you a moderator. There you go. Yeah, okay. there you go. But so, Mike, we're making you a moderator. Problem. Don't, don't, don't just screw everything up. We're making you a moderator here. Okay. Yeah, Mike, are you Mike, sure you are you sure you want to do that, Colin? I don't yeah, know. Exactly. Don't know. We got some people who want to come on stage already. But let me let me kick it off with the first question. Okay. Trademarks. Why are they even important? Like we don't need them. We can pick a name on Go GoDaddy and launch that company. Why is a trademark important, Mike? Uh trademark basically you know, it's an indicator of source. It's it's a representation of your reputation as a business. It's what your consumers come to know you as so i mean it's it's as it, it's basically like your name for your business so i mean it, it's incredibly important because it's more or less the first thing that any consumer is going to see or recognize about your business um in addition to that in addition to sort of the practical importance and from your perspective, I mean, it helps you create, you know, what you call the moat around your product because it gives you an exclusive right to use that name or any confusingly similar name in connection, not only with the product that you specifically sell, but also with any arguably related products. So trademark, the scope of trademark protection can be fairly broad depending on the trademark that you choose and whether or not there are already others out there that are using arguably similar marks for arguably similar things. Awesome. So we, I promised we'd say, share some horror stories. So here's one. I was working with a company. They spent about two years with the brands. Built it up probably to about a couple million dollars in revenue. It was an e-commerce brand. And then I went to the, um, at the time, it was called the Test Database. And now I know that they've changed that. They, they seem to have eliminated that database and they've done a new trademark database. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this company uh, had violated the trademark for um, for a a, a fortune 500 company it was a mattress company like i think it was simmons or one of those mattress companies and they had to rebrand so the cost to this company that had a couple million dollars in sales and revenue had really invested a lot in their brand was pretty significant because they didn't look to see if there was a trademark they got the domain name and that surprised me too, is that they had the domain name, but they didn't actually have the trademark, but then someone else had the trademark. But they got the domain name, but they had to rebrand into a completely different brand. How does a small business, especially one when, you know, we have a lot of people in the audience, Mike, who, who just started their business. They don't have a lot of budget to go spend $1,000 for lawyers right away. Like, 
how do we from the gate get go how do we how do we avoid running into a problem like that well i mean google is free right and the uh, the us trademark office website is free as you say it used the search function there used to be called tess they sunsetted that uh, late last year now it's at uh, tmsearch.uspto.gov and um, it's 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 quite nice much better easier to use interface than it was a few months ago actually um, but the key is to to actually be as thorough as you can in searching those two tools, Google and the Trademark Office website. Of course, the USPTO is just that, it's, it's the United States. So if your business is, has ambitions beyond the United States, then that's not enough. There's also something called the, the uh, WIPO brand database, WIPO, W-I-P-O, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, and they register trademarks internationally in pretty much every major country is included in that database. So those are, those are the three things that you want to spend some time searching and, and not only for the direct name that you're looking at, but also for variants, because as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it's anything that's confusingly similar can come up and rear, rear its ugly head later. And, and that doesn't just mean the plurals, that means, you know, substituting any characters in for various characters you know, throughout your name. You got you to sort of be clever about it if you don't want to spend the money to, to you know, pay a lawyer or get a, get a trademark search done, which will cost, I mean, you, you get a good trademark search done these days for $500, lots of places online, including with our, and with our firm, we'll, we will do a U.S. trademark search for $500. So it's it's not a huge expense, and it gives you a, a lot of comfort as you start to invest in your business that you're not going to have to rebrand later and reinvest in a new name and paying lawyers to fight a fight for you. Um, you know, there could be damages involved if, if, if you do if you do it really egregiously. So it's and I can't emphasize how important it is to think about these things at the outset of your business because uh, the problems down the road are, are just exponentially greater than a $500 search cost. Yeah. All right. I, I, I'm going to give a story, Mike. Okay. So in full disclosure, everyone, Mike is our intellectual property attorney, him and Jonathan. Jonathan worked for us too. Um, it, you know, as our uh, counsel, our lead counsel. So we were trying to be cheap, okay? I'm just saying this to everyone. We wanted to launch a new brand, okay? We're trying to be cheap. We got the domain and we're thinking, oh, no one has it right now. No one has it. So what is the risk? So lo and behold, we're ready to execute the brand, the marketing, and guess what? Someone three months before us had registered a trademark using that exact brand. So instead of spending, I mean, I don't know, Mike, you tell me, whatever, a couple thousand dollars to launch it, maybe cheaper, I don't know, to register it, I'm saying specifically. Now I had to fight it. Okay, yeah. that costs a lot, lot, much more money, excuse me, and it, it, gosh, and it probably took a year of our time and delayed our plans. But isn't it We're, based on first use, though, or is it first registration? I, I don't know, Michael. Uh, so in the United States, you get trademark rights without registering it, simply by using them in commerce. But registration gives you a bunch of additional benefits, perhaps the most important of which is that you are searchable in the trade in the U.S. Trademark Office database, so that any other responsible people that are coming forward in the future will see you and hopefully choose a different name and avoid a problem. But it also gives you benefits like the ability to recover attorney's fees if you ever be down the road for infringing your mark. So re registration is very important, but the but 
more important, especially for startups without big budgets, is to at least do a very good search. Of course, we always recommend that you then, if we clear a mark for your use, we are always going to recommend that you go ahead and file an application with the trademark office. You know, that's another thousand bucks all in basically to the end of the process. And then you get a trademark registration. Then you've got a moat around your brand. Yeah. And hence what I was saying, like, it was really kind of silly what we did. We should have just like, if we were serious about the name and the mark, we should have just like spent that, what I think you said, thousand dollars. And instead we had to spend probably three times that much. Maybe that's not a lot of money for a lot of people, but for us, we're very, you know, conscientious about these things, especially when we're launching them. Yeah, it's, it's critically important. I, I mean, otherwise you're looking at, at having to basically redo everything you've, you've already done. You have to redo all your marketing comm pieces. You, you got to select another domain name. I mean, it's, the, the the problem of a rebrand is is immense and you just don't want to go there you're you're just so much smarter to spend time up front getting comfortable that you're not going to have such a risk with that and, and, and i would say for us and then you don't have to wait a year like that probably cost me more michael and jonathan than whatever the two three thousand dollars is that then i'm like oh shoot now i have to wait a year because i really messed up yeah with a lot of uncertainty too whether you're going to be sued it's not a fun place to be for for a young business if i could jump in there is an additional um a, a huge additional benefit of registering your trademark in that um one of the biggest points of infringement um, it's no longer um, the point of sale, it's the point of the internet so, or the, the, the website. So if you have a trademark and you're using it um, and someone comes on and registers a domain name that incorporates your trademark. Um, so you say you want to file a UDRP, which is a lot cheaper than, uh, than a federal action. You're a lot more likely to win this UDRP if you have a trademark registration because you have to show the bad faith of the party that registered it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and it segues also to, to another sort of aspect of trademark protection, which of course is domain names. You know, generally those correspond to your trademark. And it's very smart to invest a bit in, in, a, in a little bit of a domain portfolio rather than just having one domain name. Think about the different variants that people, you know, that, that nefarious people might register to mess with your business or to try to steal the goodwill that you build up in your business. So again, I mean, obvious ones are adding an S to the end of whatever your name is. But, but just, you know, again, being clever about it, thinking proactively about, you know, what would you do if somebody wanted to mess with, with, mess with me, you know? And because and, domain names are very cheap to register, you know, 20 bucks a year dot com. So it, it, it really, again, behooves you to think not only about trademarks, but about domain name registrations to protect your brand. Okay, so can I understand this a little bit better? So you're saying that if, if, if I have a trademark, I can stop somebody from registering a domain name or I can get that domain name from them? No, you can't stop somebody from registering a domain name. But as Jonathan was alluding to, you will have a, a much easier time stopping them if they, if they, so registration is one thing, but then if they put it to use to mess with your business some way, to siphon traffic from your website, to create a phishing campaign, I mean, all sorts of things we see every day, um, then you have a, a remedy available to you. It's called a UDRP, it's a Uniform Domain domain name dispute resolution policy. It's something that you agree to every time you register a domain name. And basically it's a much faster, much cheaper option than going to court to stop that bad behavior. All right, got it. Um, look, I mean, this is technical. This is sort of like stuff that 
as we do within startups, we don't really want to think about, but it's really important. It's really important to get your name straight. It's it's in, in especially in today's world, you know, with so many businesses and so much out there and so much social media and everything, the name is important. And if you build a brand and you have to change it, that can be can be very scary. Um, what about a name like paw.com, P A W dot com? Can you know, I know we've talked about this in the past, but you know, it's something that is so generic, you just can't trademark it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, and paw is definitely not generic. I mean, you're not selling paws, you're selling pet products. So, you know, paw is is actually a good trademark and it's a great domain name because it's so so, so short. Um, but, you know, we trademarks are sort of, there's a, 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 a range of strength of marks from really descriptive things to really arbitrary things like, you know, Yahoo or Google compared to, you know, paw sort of falls in the middle, what we call suggestive. It suggests pets and, or at least dogs and cats and other things with paws, but it doesn't describe anything that you're selling. So it's actually quite a strong trademark. Okay, that's interesting because we haven't, you know, we, we we haven't actually got the trademark for it yet. I think we've worked right. we're working with you on that one, but um, but but yeah, there's but something that's about not, that's not because of the weakness of the mark. That's because of other people that are out there. I mean, it's just yeah, so, but yeah, maybe so, give a us million some... companies use Paw though. Like, uh, you know, it's that's the problem we have, right? So it's hard to get a trademark when. Like if you if you have a company like well you know famous story like Xerox you know yep. it's obviously a very unique word you know um, when you make up words they tend to have better you, you tend to be able to trademark them better um, but when you go with something generic it's hard to trademark but then at the same time you get better SEO juice from your domain name so it's a little bit of a give and That's take right. you know That's right yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, these are the things that that young businesses struggle with all of the time in in deciding what to name their business. But the more descriptive the name is, the more others are going to use it, and the narrower the scope of protection you're going to have. Um, on the other hand, when you create a, a an arbitrary brand, a arbitrary brand, then you got to spend a lot more money in a market and 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 get consumers to associate that arbitrary word with your product. Yeah, so it's a balance, right? I have a question when it's I, I think the point is it's a real balance in terms of what you could, um, you know, trademark, I guess that's the right terminology, versus what is good for branding. And I, I would argue, I'll, I'll say that, I would argue for not making upwards for a new brand because it's, you know, you're not going to get SEO and that requires a lot of money to spend in education, I would argue for more generic. So really what is the right balance? I have yeah. a question when it's my turn. I don't know. Hey, Jason, um, just hold on a second. We have Gabriel, Gabriel's been very patient. We'll jump right to you next. Um, did, did you want to answer that, Mike? What was the right balance? Is that the question you're asking, Michelle? I mean, that, of course, the classic lawyer answer is it depends. It depends on what your business is. What else is out there? What words you're looking at? I mean, you just cannot answer that question in the abstract. Yeah. All right. Well, just, Gabriel, you've been very patient. And uh, I don't know if you have a trademark story or if you have a question for Mike Rodenbaugh or Jonathan Frost, who are two uh, very successful lawyers. And um, I know in the past have helped us out on a lot of these trademark and copyright issues. So Gabriel, uh, any questions or experiences or thoughts? <clears throat> hey guys, um, no, I don't. I don't really have experiences, to be honest. Um, my only question it will be. Um, I think it's gonna be for Jonathan for the legal for the legal stuff and 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 my business. Um, what what kind of contracts does he recommend for when building a partnership, you know, with someone, um, with like an investor or someone, you know what I mean? Like what kind of paperwork should we, should we get, you know what I mean? 
Um, and and I'm talking more like about like for small investments, you know, like for, you know, when you have like family members, you know, they want to invest twenty, forty thousand dollars in your business, you know, like um, what kind of what kind of paperwork should we get, you know, for because sometimes we used to do like, um, you know, we just I don't know, we just you know talk, you know, and like oh okay yeah um borrow me the money I'll pay you later, but. I want to do like the right way. You know what I mean? That's my question. You know, like, you know, when making deals uh, with, with family members, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Gabriel. That's a fantastic question. Um, just as Mike said, the, the answer um, is always, it depends. Um, it depends on the scale of the business. It depends on um, the size of the business. It depends on who you're talking to. It depends on who they, if, whether they approached you or not. Um, if this is just a small, your family's investing in your business, then at the absolute minimum, you need to have a, an agreement that represents what stock you're giving them and what their obligations are and what ownership in your company they're getting. And to the extent to which this is equity and the extent to which this is, uh, this is debt, Mm -hmm. um, also, you need to have your corporate paperwork straight so that when they come and they say, okay, I own some of this business, um, it's very clear what that means, whether it's a corporation and they own stock, whether they have voting rights. Um, these are all things that um, they aren't automatic. So you have to have them set up. Mm-hmm. A, a, another question, on, oh, uh, excuse me, I mean, go ahead. No, go, okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Finish, finish oh, your thought, Jonathan. Another, another, another question on this is, do I have to do an SEC registration? Um, this, this question, it's filing a Form D for very small investments, potentially. It creeps up. And sometimes you'd, you'd be surprised by, by um, how often you have to do a registration with the SEC when giving out stock. So that's, that's another question that just needs to be answered. That's based on the size, the size of your company. And just sort of bring it back to, back to our topic today, which is really around IP. It's very important that any agreements with investors, you know, make it clear that they're not taking any ownership interest in the IP of the company. There's lots and lots of horror stories about, you know, so-called joint ownership of, of IP. And it's just, that's another place you never want to find yourself. You want to make, always be very clear that it's your business that owns the IP I- in the business. And then that means also from your perspective as a founder, you want to make sure that it's not in your name because that can raise liability issues for you as an individual, for your family, for your home. You want to make sure the reason that you have an LLC or a corporation is to to take that liability. And so, you know, trademarks, copyrights, patents, these are business assets that need to be owned solely and exclusively by your business. Well, thank thank you for that, Gabriel. And we're going to, Jason, we're going to jump down to you next. Do you have a question or a trademark horror story? Well, not a horror story, but I do think I do want to save a lot of people from not starting their businesses uh, their whole life because I've heard of many people that get confused and they think that the first step is paying the lawyers to trademark things. And I've talked to many lawyers that I don't know if it's their lack of knowledge or that they've invested in the system and they refuse to be honest about the limitations of that system. What I mean is this, I worked at Microsoft in 98, 99 as an anti-piracy marketing associate. And I worked with, and the lawyers were heavily in that department. And a lot of people think that if they can't afford to pay lawyers to trademark something, they shouldn't start. And this is the opposite of the way it works. I believe that you should first get it, like for instance, get the .com. And if it's not being used yet, Like, I don't know how Clubhouse managed to, um, I don't really know the full story, but I do know that, for instance, somebody else was using Clubhouse trademark and they had to settle out of court. I don't know how for how much, but I teach that first you secure a unique name that's not being used in that field, in that area, because trademarks are for particular areas. So if, for instance, .com, like I'll say for me, 
I get a dot com. Like I've had free shares or I've spelled free P H R E E since 1999. I was the first person to do that because when, because I bought B H R E E dot com. I also bought P H R E houses yeah. and everything. So, and free everything, you know, I bought over a hundred, but my point is this lawyers tell me that I shouldn't just use it, that I should pay them then trademark it. And I would have paid lawyers millions of dollars by now to trademark every single word that spells with P-H-R-E-E because that's what I was doing in 99. I went to the psych board because it was too many, too much. And uh, I didn't pay a lawyer, but I came out and I registered a whole corporation in Canada named Free Shares Incorporated. Now, my point is this. If I would pay lawyers since 1999, I still haven't made any money with that. Free Shares does everything for free. Okay, I'm, I, I preach a gospel, so... That's what we do in the church. But my point is this, 25 years, that's 25 years ago. Every, sorry, lawyers, every single year, if I talk to the same lawyers, they would still say I have to pay them for 25 years. I haven't made any money with that. Okay, so what my point is this, people have to have at least a little bit of knowledge before they go and pay lawyers because there are some lawyers that still think that they that I should have been paying all of these years. To trademark things, first of all, it's country based. So then I'd have to pay in the US, I'd have to pay in all these other countries or the, the thing where they do it globally. And I still hadn't made any money. And this stops a lot of people from starting a business because they get caught up in worrying about paying lawyers before they've even validated that the business is a good idea, that it will make money. That That's the hardest thing about business is making money. It's not protecting your intellectual property. You have to make sure it's worthy of being protected. Still to this day, lawyers talk to me and say I should have trademarked the thing. How can somebody trademark it? So here's the question. Would anybody be successful <laughs> trademarking one of my dot coms that I've used since 1999 that I spell P-H-R-E-E? It's protected by my family name, Humphreys. I don't care. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, they can all try to trademark the things. Which country is going to believe that they first did that when I did that and I'm in the newspaper for it in 19, since 1999? <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess that's my question. Am I not correct? Even though I don't have a law degree, I got accepted to Oscar Law School, but I decided not to go because I wanted to be more like Bill Gates Jr. than Bill Gates Sr. Bill Gates Jr. dropped out. I'm done speaking. You got a few things right in there and, and a few things quite wrong, um, Jason. You know, yes, trademark rights are territorial. You, you have to register them in, in individual countries in order to have rights there. Outside the United States, the fact that you are a prior user of a mark is not doesn't matter because almost everywhere outside the United States and Canada, trademark rights are based on registration, not on use. So the fact that you have used free whatever for 25 years in China won't matter if somebody goes tomorrow and registers free whatever as a trademark. They can then prevent you, they can sue you and prevent you from doing business in China. That's just a fact. And the, okay. the fact that you've used it for 25 years is great for you. You could register your marks now wherever you want in the United States or anywhere else and, and, and enhance the protection that you have and prevent, be able then to prevent others from using the mark. But as of now, you're not registered in China. The fact that you have a, the domain name is great. The fact you build a business is great. But the reality is that somebody in China could literally stop you from using your, from conducting business in that country simply by going and registering their trademark there. Okay, but that is not, does not invalidate what I said. I don't want to do business in China because China, that was the whole point. China was ripping okay. off Microsoft software. When China's one example, but, but, you know, it, it, literally any other countries, the entire Uni U European Union, in fact, is the same way. It's first to file, not first to use, as it is here in the U.S. Mike, isn't UDRP for the dot-com not superseded? If somebody goes to try to trademark one of my names in Europe and I have the dot-com, are you saying they can make me surrender my dot-com that I've used since 1999? Um, they, I'm not saying they could make you surrender your domain name. No, I'm saying that they could, they could prevent you from doing business in the European union. Theoretically, they could, what the, what at minimum, Jason, what they could do is cause you a very expensive headache. 
that requires you to hire European lawyers to fight your case. Mike, this is the kind of, can I just say something here? This is the kind of legal advice that I do not agree with because I have not made any money yet and I've had to sell my house twice. I don't have a wife or any kids. Think about the context of this. I am not concerned about European Union. What I'm saying to people is use wisdom, business wisdom, when taking advice. It has to be applicable. I'm not as big as Microsoft. I have not done any money, made any money in Europe. This is not a concern that should concern me when I haven't sold anything. And this is my point. That it's not that it's not a concern. It, it, so. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna intervene for <laughs> a second to keep it rolling. Yeah. Jason, you bring up some amazing points. And I think Mike would tell you, he'd be the first to tell you. I've worked with him for a long time. It depends on what your plans are. It depends on yeah. what your business model is. It depends on what your products are. Uh, no one's advocating that you should, you know, trademark for the world. So on that And note, you have to admit, no. Michelle, we've been pretty cheap. Like, we're like, uh, uh, okay, we're Mike, you know, we don't have any cheap. money, but can you do this, that, and the other? And, and you yeah. know, a good lawyer will work with the client exactly. and understand the needs of the client. Yeah. That's exactly. right. And, and obviously work within your budget. You know, you can only do so much. As Michelle said, it. I mean, I don't have never had a client except when I was working in-house at Yahoo that tries to register its mark everywhere in the world. I mean, only the biggest companies do that. But I do have a number of clients that register their marks in, you know, all of the major countries in the world, uh, and including the European Union. You know, you're talking, obviously, for a startup, that's that may not even be practical. But once you get to a certain level, you know, it's very worthwhile spending $10,000, $20,000 to protect your brand in all of the major economies once you get that sort of budget. Yeah, I actually also have another case study here that might interest you. Uh, we run e-commerce companies here at the incubator, and we have a product called the Pup Rug. And <laughs> we spend about $10 million a year on advertising. Uh, it's come down a little bit uh, lately as we've you know, pulled back from Facebook and whatnot. So even $5 million a year, whatever it is. But um, but what we would do is we'd advertise Pup Rug, and then a lot of people would go to Amazon, type in the word Pup Rug, and there were three copycat companies using the word Pup Rug, but we managed to finally get some form of a trademark around Pup Rug, uh, and we had them taken down. So if you're an e-commerce uh, and you have a product. I don't think a trademark is optional. You need it if you're if you're if you have a good product. If you have a product that can sell, uh, like the pup rug, uh, then you do need to trademark those products because otherwise, other copycats will use those search terms on Amazon, Amazon here, to take it from your from 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 your business. Every That's business right. needs to build a moat. And if you I can need, just if, jump you got in, a success, if you don't have a business, you don't need to build a moat. Okay, that's fine. But if you got a business, you need to build a moat. The earlier you start to build that moat, the stronger it'll be. And it doesn't cost a lot. And by the way, let's let's address that, Mike. We, if I'm a small business and I do want to get a trademark, how much does it actually cost just to file for the trademark and, and and get the actual trademark? Is this are we talking tens of thousands of dollars? No, we're talking as I said before. If you just want to get started for startups in the United States, you know, we recommend we do a search, 500 bucks, assuming everything looks good and clear, you're comfortable moving ahead using it, then we recommend you register it in the United States. That's 1100 bucks. That's all in, assuming that there's no problems that arise along the way. And of course, that's what the search is for, is to gauge the risk of any sorts of problems. So, I mean, for most businesses, you're talking $1,600 to get a trademark registered in the United States for one class that you can move ahead with your business, feeling comfortable that you're building a moat around your brand. Not, and not, not only building a, a moat to, to protect your rights, but also to, to prevent other people from coming after you. That, that's the biggest thing. One of the, you always got to look at these things both offensively and defensively. You want to be able to not only use your trademark registration to get infringers off of Amazon through use of Amazon brand registry service, but you also want to be comfortable that nobody's going to come after you with a cease and desist letter and cause you legal problems. 
because you hire you want to you come to me someone sent you a cease and desist letter you want me to look at it well now you're talking about twenty five hundred dollar minimum just for me to look at it get engaged and talk to that other lawyer yeah and that was my point earlier like i i did that i went cheap to hey, say michelle that. why don't you talk about the two hundred fifty thousand dollar issue with meowingtons and dead mouse well i i know i because uh, that's the thing so you think it's cheap but oh, then you gosh. get into these hundred thousand dollar yeah losses. I, I i was trying to avoid that colin but you know you're forcing me okay uh, I, just, I think you should All bring right, it up. I, i'm gonna use it as an example i'm gonna you know not say exact names but there is an extremely famous electronic uh, whatever dj I'm not going to say his name, but you know, it might have something I'm not saying had, it's, like, it's, it's on public record. So. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm not saying that the prior owners got in a dispute with them. Okay. This costs a lot of money and it's hurt the company. Like I can't even tell you. Okay. Colin said the name. I didn't say the name, but it, it it, it required uh, over $100,000 of cash just to keep the business live. And, you know, they, there was a decision made by the prior owners that um, they always have like certain rights on the trademark and uh, they get first rights of refusal. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, the fact, the fact of the matter is um, they, uh, they, you know, the guy has a cat that he never trademarked or anything. Meowington's here files for a trademark and then it's challenged and taken to court and we're dealing with I was I I know the it case pretty well. It was like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in legal fees. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars in legal fees before it had, and had a search and had a search been done by the prior owners, they yeah. would have seen Dead Mouse's registration so, there. They never had a registration they, though. <clears throat> yeah, I thought they did, but anyway, I may not be remembering remembering the facts precisely right because it's been a while ago. But yeah. I mean, the the reason to do a search is to see if there's any problems like that that are out there, and then you you know you you want to avoid those problems, so you pick another name. And and Jason, you like this? It's absolutely free. You just go to the trademark database in I believe it's called Nuance in Canada, uh, yeah. and. Uh, it used to be the test <laughs> database, but we, it's the uh, now the trademark database, and they've got a much better interface now for for anyone who needs to search for it. So it's it's, it's no excuse not to. Uh, Mike, I, I know we didn't talk a lot about copyright, but about mm -hmm. three months ago I called you up because uh, the book Start Scale Legs and Repeat launched on October third, became a number one bestseller on eight Amazon categories. Number two right now in the United States for starting a business. That's pretty cool today. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, but but uh, we had some copycats. We had two other books that launched with similar titles within a month or so of, of us launching the book. And we had a had someone who actually took the text from the book, the actual text, put it into a workbook, and then they put a disclaimer at the end and said, oh, this is not affiliated with the um the book start scale exit repeat and i was just curious from a copyright you know for authors or for uh people who who create content co creators and especially on on clubhouse we have a lot of creators on clubhouse like we don't can people just do that is that right that they can just <laughs> put on uh, they take my book my words my and put it on their book and sell it i mean I, you know of course it's not right um so yeah, copyright's a, a distinct thing from trademark, right? Trademark is a brand, it's a name, it's an indicator of source. Copyright is content, whether it's a song or your website content or your uh, source code, there's all sorts of different sorts of content that's copyrightable, obviously books, movies, et cetera. So the, the thing with that is similar to trademark in one sense that once you publish uh, content, you own the copyright in it. But the problem is, and which is di different than trademark, you can't sue for copyright infringement unless you've registered your copyright with the, with the United States Copyright Office. And so it's not a very uh, expensive process again. 
it's typically around five hundred dollars or so if you hire us to do it. But you, you could try to do it yourself, and then it's more like you know a hundred dollars. I think the the typical filing fees at the copyright office are under a hundred dollars. Uh, but the app, you know, like anything in in law, there's nuance to these applications. But if you're a startup, you're bootstrapping, then you can certainly go and do it yourself. It's better than nothing. Um, at least you have a leg to stand on when somebody, if if and when somebody comes and completely rips you off, like like Colin has experienced already. Yeah, and so we applied. We did. We we worked with you, Mike, uh, with your firm, Rodenbaugh dot law, spelt very weird, um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I, I I pinned it at the top of the room there. If you want to have a look, but so we worked with you, and um, but how long is it going to take before we can go back to Amazon and say? Okay, they violated. Like, can we can we go? Like, are we waiting for the copyright to come through before we can can contest it, or do we have to just can we just go sooner rather than later? Um, so yeah, you're not talking about suing the copyright owner now. You're talking about going to Amazon and asking them to do a takedown, yeah. and in which so you don't have to have a registration in order to do that. You can do that simply as the copyright owner. So we we, we can literally do that now. Okay, so that's something we'll, we'll we, we should probably work on pretty soon. I know we have our own workbook that's you know that's coming out in an actual official workbook. That the book that they came out was is an unofficial workbook based on the work by Start Scale Exit Repeat. So, all right, sounds good, Roland. I pinged you on stage. You're like such a celebrity on this show, on this podcast, and you come on many times, and we really really appreciate that. And I know you have a lot of experience on trademarks. Uh, Roland, uh, if you have any thoughts or horror stories you want to share, or if you want to ask a question of Mike and Jonathan, uh, two lawyers who specialize in trademarks and copyrights, you know, feel free to do so. If you're in the audience, we've got about five, six minutes left before we're going to cut off the uh, questions because uh, we have at three o'clock, we're jumping right over to Entree, which is a new platform. And today we're doing a master class on your X Factor. So, Roland, any thoughts on trademarks? So, Colin, two clarifications that are very important. Number one, I'm not a celebrity, and I don't associate with celebrities. Number two, I'm not an expert on trademarks. I do have some knowledge. Okay, you're things. coming in a little quiet. If you can... Better now? Yeah, much better. Okay, so I was saying two things, two clarifications. Number one, I'm not a celebrity, and I don't associate with celebrities. <laughs> Number two, I'm not a trademark expert, and I don't purport to be one. I do have some knowledge in the space, but I don't have any questions. Thanks for inviting me out. All right, sounds good, but you are a, a mini celebrity on our show, so we appreciate your support all the time. All right, so uh, Jonathan, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, you, you've been involved in a lot of domain name you know, a lot of domain names, uh, you know, you worked, worked for Dot Club, obviously a company that we ran here before. Uh, how important is it to register domain names to protect your business? You know, if you have a name, you know, you know, I, I see a lot lately with, you know, whatever dot AI, like um, business dot AI and there's dot club, as you know, and there's dot com. What are your thoughts on that? And by registering domain names, does that give you any legal protection? Um, okay, so I, I guess, um, of course, of course, it's very important to register your domain name. Um, and I think this was this what Jason was getting at earlier, to the exclusion of legal uh, protections. Um, he, he really appreciated the um, registering your domain name. Um, so I mean, I'd say it's, it's, it's up there with with the trademark registrations. Uh, why is that? Well, let's say you're an e-commerce company. Of course you have to register your domain names because someone's gonna come in and compete with you. And okay, let's say you're not an e-commerce company. Like you're a, I don't know, a printer. So let's say a competitor comes in and registers your name and now you've got a legal battle with them. Um, so either way, no matter what kind of business you are, it, it's really important because that's your, that's that's your name in the yellow pages. Like this isn't, um, there are no more yellow pages. It's your domain name. So, I mean, I would say it's, it's of the highest importance. 
Yeah, let me let me let me add to that. So, while trademark registrations can get expensive in other countries, domain registrations are a lot cheaper. You know, even country code domain registrations, you know, sometimes they can be fifty dollars. Sometimes they can even be over a hundred dollars. But that's a heck of a lot cheaper than trying to register a trademark in another country. And so, what we call it is de facto trademark protection. If you own the domain name that directly corresponds to your trademark, you know that's that's going to keep most people away from using that name for your business in in that country, even without the trademark registration. So even don't, if, let me ask you a question about that because it's interesting. Like so, you know, you have there's a, an app and another LLM just launched called Pi Pi dot AI. Love it. It's actually amazing. In fact, next week, the show is Pi AI is going to interview me for the book. Uh, so it's actually pretty funny. But so if somebody owns PiAI.com and then I get Pi.ai, who's got the rights to it here? Can you talk a bit about that, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it depends. If PiAI.com has a business called PiAI that predates Pi.ai, then the dot com business it has trademark priority and can stop pi.ai from doing business literally i mean it, it really depends on who's first to market with their product in the united states that gives you trademark ownership in the united states um domain names don't give you any legal rights but they give you very strong practical rights because people can't do business on the internet without one so, so if I had so Roland, so if I had pay pi ai dot com, can I if somebody launches pi dot ai, can I do a UDRP of pi dot ai if it's in the same business? Yes, quite possibly. With the proviso okay. that um, dot ai probably is not on the UDRP system, but there may be some equivalent system in the AI space. True. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure whether dot AI has adopted a UDRP like process or not. Yeah, now we're getting a little technical, but the UDRP generally only applies to GTLD domain names, dot com, net, or all the new ones. Country codes, most of them have adopted some form of a UDRP for their particular country. All right, Roland, I know you want to jump in here. Yeah, I wanted to ask Mike a follow on question. So Mike said they can practically stop the other company from doing business. Is it an, a competitive thing or is it just a branding thing? Branding thing, I mean, which okay. is a competitive thing. I mean, they're, they're one and the same. But, you yeah, know, if you own the, if you own the domain, if you own the domain name, then nobody else can use it. Right. right. There's That's only right. one of each domain name. They can change their name, right? Sure. They could add letters to it, and register other domains, and then, then you know, your domain name is not going to give you any real rights. But if you have a trademark registration, then you could use that to go after them. So awesome. my follow-up question is, does that mean that having a certain domain name is a precursor to having a certain trademark? No, it's, it, it's not. I mean, often they go hand in hand. I mean, tip, almost always your domain name corresponds directly to your trademark. And in general, best practice, obviously, is, is just that, that you have both and that they are the same. Thank you. But the fact that you have a domain name registration does not give you any legal rights other than to use that domain name exclusively for your business. Only trademark registration gives you rights to exclude others from using confusingly similar trademarks and domain names. All right, Mike. So we're running down the last couple minutes here, and we got to jump over to that masterclass. But I, I wanted to just ask a practical question. So, how does somebody? Okay, you got a name, and and and, and Jason, let's just say you got some business coming in. You expect it, you know, you start. You, whether revenue is coming in or not, revenue you expect the revenue to come in. Uh, you're starting to make some money. What is the step I do? Like, oh, I just pick up the phone and call you. Do you have a, you go to the website? Like, what is it that whether it's you or any lawyer? Like, what is the first thing I need to do? 
Well, I, yeah, again, of course, reach out to us through, through my website or otherwise. And, you know, 1600 bucks, we will do a trademark search for you and get your trademark application on file for you. Okay, um, so tell us what is the email, or I'm sorry, what is your website? I, I know that uh, many people here, actually, I think that's quite a deal. You're being generous, Mike and Jonathan. How do we get to your website and how do we actually make that request? Well, it's rodenbaugh.law is the website, or you can always email Spell me. Spell it at, for uh, us. Yeah, because some people Rodenbaugh. do this for the podcast here. So not everybody right. has the benefit of the, uh, yeah. Wait, let him go. It's R O D E N B A U G H, Rodenbaugh Law, or Mike at Rodenbaugh.com, info at Rodenbaugh.com. Lots of ways to get to me. I'm on LinkedIn. I mean, you, you can find me as long as you can spell Rodenbaugh, R O D E N B A U G H. And it's interesting, you have a Rodenbaugh.law, so R O D E N B A U G H dot law. But do you have a dot com? Like, do you have rodenbaugh.law.com? I have. Yes, I do. You know, I've got various names around it. Um, but yeah, I've always had rodenbaugh.com since you know, the 90s. And I haven't really transitioned email over to that yet, simply because I've had it since the 90s. So I've just kept kept. I know, my but you email seem to be promoting gone. the dot law. He's old school. I don't know. No, but you're, I'm old no, school, but on the, I'm old on the school link that I have way, up here. But I'm new school with the dot law because I, know. I have lots of clients, uh, domain name registries like Colin used to be with dot club. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm a big supporter of new top level domains. And uh, that part, part of that is the dot law top level domain that I do use for the website. I think when I searched the like, Internet, I typed in like uh, Mike Rodenbaugh and that's what came up. That's why I pinned it yeah. at the top of the room here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. You don't have to have a dot com, but it sounds like you still need one ultimately to protect yourself. Uh, that's one of those moats. And it's not. A, and Jason, you'll probably agree with me on this one, uh, that even if you uh, don't use a dot com, you still want to have the dot com because it still is the king. And it sends a statement that you own that name. It's in a way it's a sort of a mini it's its own little trademark, global trademark verification, having a dot com. Uh, and, and this comes from a, from somebody who owns own dot club, in which I, I do truly believe there's alternatives available. But we also own pa dot com and, and uh, we also have pa dot club, P A W dot club, which we use. Um, I'm working with the Allen Allen Levan Center, and they're a huge incubator here in South Florida. And they have the dot com, but also the dot club to uh, because they want to make it feel like a club. So it really depends. And, you know, dot AI dot law. There are some good names with meaning. You've been listening to start, scale, exit, repeat, serial entrepreneur secrets revealed. I just want to make an announcement right now that uh, Forbes books has put that book, that title. Uh, you know, it's the title of the podcast. It's the title of the show. It's also the title of the book that came out October 3rd, uh, 2023. And it is the, um, it has been number one in eight categories. It is number two right now today on Amazon for starting a business ebook and Forbes books, put it on sale for 24 hours. That's it. And if you wanted to get a copy of it, this would be the time to do that. Uh, we had a meeting with Forbes yesterday, Michelle and I. The second edition print is already selling out. They only have 200 copies left on the hardcover. Um, and they've done the third edition print is, got, is going to press now. And the fourth edition print, which will be paperback, is also going to print. Uh, and, and we just had an incredible response. We're doing right now. Right now, at this very second, if you jump to Entree, I don't know if you can pin the link, Mimi or Michelle. If you jump to Entree, we are doing a masterclass. It's free. And by the way, it's not free uh, after the original airing. It will become part of the pro membership on Entree. So we'll see you all on Entree. It's all about the X factor. What is it that makes you different and unique and can make you successful in business? On Entree. Right, let's 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 spell that so everyone can actually download the app. It's E N T R E, 
and it is a new app that is for entrepreneurs exclusively. Right, Colin? Yeah. All right. Well, I hope everyone has an amazing weekend and we look forward to seeing you here or hearing you here, I should say, next week, Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And a very big special thank you to our special guests, Jonathan Frost and Michael Rodenball. Please reach out to them if you have any questions. I know they would love to talk to you about any intellectual property and business law, I believe, too, questions. So have an amazing weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Colin.